for a brief moment, I'm going to take us away from uh, Arizona and to the northwest, uh, out of this beautiful desert oasis and along the Pacific coast to Macaw Bay on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. In the tide pools that line the shores live mussels, barnacles, sea snails, and other shallow water-dwelling creatures. Spend enough time there, and you'll find that the mussels aren't terribly well behaved. If there aren't enough of their natural predators around, the mussels devour the food supply and eventually take over the entire waterfront. The interesting thing is this happens in some places, but not in others. And for a long time, we had no idea why. So ecologists mapped the ecosystem's dynamics, charting all of the connections, and they created a comprehensive view of everything and how it connected. And with that map, they found something curious. It turns out that one species was keeping the whole system in balance. They called it the keystone species. Do you know what the single most powerful creature in the ecosystem was? It was the mighty starfish, that staple of touch tanks across the country that when your kids pick them up, they don't even move. A natural predator of mussels, it was the starfish that kept the rest of the tide pool balanced between predator and prey. It turns out there are keystone species keeping entire ecosystems in balance all over the world. In Monterey, it's the adorable otters eating the sea urchins and maintaining the kelp's teeming wildlife. In the Avon wheat belt of Australia, it's the honey eaters who singularly keep the diverse flora pollinated. Keystone species. What if we have them in STEM education too? For the first five years of 100K and 10, this wasn't a question we had a bandwidth to think about. Working side by side and arm in arm with you, we were laser focused on building a network capable of hitting the moonshot 100,000 goal. And together, we have built that network. Because of you, I'm honored to announce that we have 54,000 more talented STEM teachers inspiring today's students, children of immigrants and coal miners, children of factory workers and doctors, dreamers all and helping them to realize their dream. I know, it's so awesome. <laughs> We're actually outpacing our targets by nearly 10%. And because of you, we are on track to fill our classrooms with 100,000 excellent STEM teachers on time by 2021. <laughs> this is not us. Our, our tiny team could not have done this. This is this network working together. And that moon we were shooting at, those 100,000 teachers, we were on track to reach it. But here's the thing. In building the network capable of hitting the 100,000, we actually were able to see something that had eluded the field. What if the success of our various efforts, these incredible efforts all around the country, were actually covering up the real challenge? Because despite our progress, phenomenal though it is, not enough people still want to become teachers or stay in the classroom. What if every other problem can be traced back to that? It's as if we're in a sinking boat, and what we've done here is put together a team of bail bailers capable of bailing out the water just as fast as it's coming in, which is pretty great as long as all of us keep bailing. But bailing is tiring work, and if our arms start to get tired, we might start to quit. And those of us who have been in the trenches of education long know what that feels like. And if we ever stop bailing, well, without plugging the holes, that boat's going to sink. And so we had a choice. Either keep bailing out the boat in Sisyphean 10-year cycles of 100,000 teachers, or start to plug the holes. But how does anyone plug the holes of a boat as big as our education system, with four to five million teachers, 50 million students attending 100,000 schools. If you'll pardon me jumping out of the sinking boat and back into the ocean, we had to find our starfish. What matters the most when it comes to attracting people to the teaching profession? And what matters the most when it comes to keeping teachers from quitting the classroom? Just as ecologists had to understand all of the components and connections of the ecosystem of Macaw Bay to reveal the starfish, so we had to understand all of the components of the STEM education system to find our keystone. But it turns out that's pretty hard to do. The writer David Foster Wallace opened his commencement address at Canyon College with a little joke. It goes something like this. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, 
morning, boys. How's the water? And these two fish, they swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and says, what the hell is water? <laughs> whether, whether fish are human, one of the most natural things we do is see the world from where we stand, or swim, I guess, and take action from that limited perspective. In fact, neuroscientists, biologists, and behavioral economists have confirmed that we're hardwired to do exactly this. The same scene can be perceived different ways. Remember this stress? I nearly came to fights in my office. Caribou in the Arctic have eyes that evolved to see ultraviolet, so that what looks all white to us reveals for them shrub, shrubs and lichen that stand out from the snow. Our senses only detect a small fraction of what's out there, and we're hardwired to miss the things we're not paying attention to. Only one of these will pee on your carpet if you're not paying attention. <laughs> Each of us sees a critical piece of the puzzle of why it's hard to get and keep great teachers, especially in STEM, but we only see our own piece. So until we gathered all of your perspectives, and many more yet, it was impossible to see the whole. Without seeing the whole, the action we were taking was inevitably limited. So we asked hundreds, and eventually thousands of teachers, principals, and other key stakeholders one basic question. Why is it so hard to get and keep great teachers, especially in STEM? We asked why and why and why again until we hit bedrock. And by the end, we had a list of more than 100 discrete, discrete challenges standing in the way of a healthy STEM teaching ecosystem. If anything has ever made you dizzy looking at a huge screen, it's probably this list. <laughs> so we organized those 100 challenges into seven major themes. The prestige of teaching, STEM teacher preparation, the particular challenges faced by elementary STEM teachers, opportunities for professional growth, teacher experimentation and leadership, the value we put on science, tech, and engineering in particular, and then high quality instructional materials. It was comprehensive, but it was also paralyzing. How does anyone take action on 100 challenges at once? What we needed was a map that showed how the problems related to one another which ones contributed to others, and which were really symptoms of deeper causes. So we adapted tools from ecology and network sciences, and we went back and asked one more question. Choosing any of those two root causes at random, if A got better, what happened to B? Did it get better, worse, or stay the same? More than 750 of you and colleagues from around the country weighed in with more than 35,000 votes. And with all of that input, we did something that no one working on a social sector problem has done before. We mapped the entire ecosystem. The map is the best of citizen cartography, each of us contributing what we know to create a comprehensive view of a landscape that could never have been seen through any one of our eyes alone. And for the first time, we could see everything in one place. The problems, yes, but also their root causes and every connection. This is what the STEM ecosystem of teaching looks like. Our ecosystem in education has two characteristics that mirror every ecosystem in the natural world. The first is that everything is connected, so that no single isolated change or program is going to make a lasting dent in any big problem we care about. Now, we know this, right? Like, we know there are no silver bullets, and we know like from all those movies, right, that a butterfly is flapping its wings over here, creates a hurricane over there, or someone falling in love somewhere else. But most of the time, we still act as though it's not true. We act as though our one program is going to make the difference. Um, but it can't. It can't alone because everything is connected. But we learned something else, which is that everything isn't equally connected, and it's not randomly connected either. And it's actually that non-randomness that helps us to simplify so we can find our starfish. And when we find our starfish, we know where to focus so that the entire ecosystem can flourish. What we distill from those 35,000 votes is that to our honest to God great surprise, the starfish and the STEM teaching ecosystem has many arms. It is not just five. Uh, it's like a mutant starfish. Uh, every one of the themes from prestige to teacher leadership to instructional materials has at least one keystone species. One place where progress on that discrete challenge has a domino-like effect on the rest of the problems to getting and keeping great teachers, especially in STEM. 
which means that anywhere you work, you remember one thing, anywhere you work in the system, there's a place of high leverage nearby where if you have a chance to focus there and make progress there, has a shot at making everything easier for others. We're calling those, key, those keystone species catalysts, and they include scholarships or loan forgiveness for STEM undergraduates who become STEM teachers, statewide tracking of STEM teacher supply and demand, teacher preparation faculty with specific expertise in elementary STEM, some of my know are in this room, the opportunity for teacher collaboration and professional development during the school day, school leaders responsible for creating positive work environments. We hold school leaders responsible for so much else. What would it look like if we held them responsible for creating positive school environments for their teachers? The number and range of STEM courses required in high schools and districts identification of high quality engineering curriculum. You can see all of them in the pocket size grand challenges book in your bag. Wherever each of us is working, there's a place of high leverage. At 100K and 10, we'll continue to support you wherever in the system you are tackling these challenges. We will also support you to get close to high leverage wherever you're willing to do that. And beginning this year, we're going to focus on the tight group of catalysts related directly to teachers' lived experience in the classroom. So opportunities for teacher professional development and collaboration during the school day, as well as how school leaders are responsible and supported to create positive work environments. We'll be experimenting with how, as a network, we can take on these challenges together, building on all of the amazing collaborative work that this network has been doing for now seven years. Look out for opportunities to work with us on these issues starting this month. Remember the honey eaters from Western Australia that singularly pollinate the numerous plants? There's a period each year where acorn banksia, this tree that you're seeing, is their sole source of nectar. Understanding the keystone quality of the honey eater actually helps us to see that we need to partner with those protecting the acorn banksia if the ecosystem is to thrive. It's true in STEM teaching as well. Because these challenges are multifaceted and everything is connected, progress on any challenge requires a network that can take action in a way that addresses the complexity. Systems thinker Todd Kozin said, the solitary genius who will save us with an aha moment and a miraculous solution, it's a myth. Instead, we must bring complex networks of humans to bear on our problems. Luckily, we're here as part of 100 Gay and 10, one of the strongest globally recognized examples of networked impact. impact. We represent 280 organizations from every sector, likely and unlikely allies both, committed to one ambitious goal of 100,000 excellent STEM teachers. Nowhere else in this country does this diversity of organizations come together to learn and collaborate. Multinational corporations, alongside universities, school districts with CMOs, nonprofits, local, state, federal agencies, zoos, organizations that sometimes feel like zoos, <laughs> yes, uh, science museums and philanthropies also. In this room, we work on every facet of STEM education, on every part of the STEM teacher pipeline, in every grade from the littlest tots to those who will vote for the first time in the 2018 elections. In 100K and 10, we know that no change is possible unless each one of us shows up and gives of our passion, our perspective, and our expertise. This is why your organizations have made commitments to contribute to our shared goal. And it is why we are so honored that you have chosen of your time, your most precious commodity, to be here with us today. Our job is to make sure that you have a way to connect with whatever time and resources you have, not just today, but all year, in a way that will matter to you, to your organization, to the field, and ultimately to our students. This past year, we reached new heights as a network. The network facilitated more than 200 collaborations involving hundreds of people and organizations. You worked in large learning communities, in small prob problem solving teams, on project teams, and one on one. You co-invested in shared solutions and found innovative efforts to fund. And you told us that because of 100K and 10, 85% of you learned something new, 74% of you shared insights, and 69% of you tackled big challenges you could not have taken on alone. As a result, 33% of you started a new program from scratch, and 30% of you adapted another partner's practice. 
you made the countercultural choice to collaborate when you might have gone it alone, to reveal a challenge when you might have kept quiet, to share an idea as it emerged instead of holding your cards close. And when we choose to go together like that, and when we focus our energy on what we can solve together, that is when real change happens. The evolving study of our brain teaches us that the more we know, the less open we are to discovery and wonder. The STEM subjects taught well open us up to the diversity and complexity that surrounds us. They can unlock, in David Foster Wallace's words, a simple awareness, awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water.